Welcome everyone to this session on education. During this session, we are going to be listening to four video presentations. Now, after all the presentations are completed, we will have each paper's discussant provide comments for a maximum of five minutes, after which we will open up the floor for 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A um, as the time permits. And now during the video presentations, attendees will be able to write questions in the written Q&A box and not the chat box, please. Attendees can use the thumbs up feature in the chat for questions or comments that they support. And this will move popular questions to the top of the list. And then the Q&A moderator can come back to these questions and comments after the discussions um, contributions. Um, please be sure that when you use the Q&A chat box, you indicate, indicate which of the speakers your questions and your comments are directed at. Alternatively, you may raise your hand during the Q&A session and pose your question vocally. And we will now begin um, the video presentations for this session. We are going to start off with David Lamb from the University of Michigan. He is going to be pre presenting on his paper titled Schooling Inequality, Returns to Schooling and Earnings Inequality, Evidence from Brazil and South Africa. Can we have the video now, please? Hi, I'm David Lamb. Very happy to present this paper co-authored with Murray Labrant from University of Cape Town and Arden Finn, formerly of University of Cape Town, now at the World Bank. In this paper, we're interested in levels of income inequality in Brazil and South Africa. They've long had two of the highest levels of inequality in the world. And education plays an important role in this inequality through two pathways. One, education itself is highly unequal. And two, there's a very strong relationship between schooling and earnings. So in this paper, we look at what's happened to the distribution of education and schooling inequality, what's happened to returns to schooling, and how do these factors affect earnings inequality? And in particular, how can we model the relationship when the returns to schooling are different at different levels of schooling? So to begin with earnings inequality, this is a Gini coefficient for individual earnings for uh, people aged 25 to 59. Here's Brazil. We have very good survey data back to 1976. For South Africa, our survey data began around the end of apartheid in 1994. And uh, what we see here is that at the end of apartheid, the two countries had very similar levels of inequality. Those were among the highest levels of inequality in the world. And since then, Brazil's inequality has gone down, while South Africa's has uh, stayed the same or even gone up. We won't focus too much on these variations from year to year, but on the big picture that South Africa's inequality uh, has not had the same kind of decline uh, as Brazil has. Here's another measure, variance of log earnings. We like this because it's decomposable and closely uh, relatable to the uh, Minster earnings equation, which we're going to take advantage of. And you can see that the trends are very similar to the Gini coefficient. So if we take a standard Minster uh, earnings equation, we have log earnings as a function of uh, schooling. We'll imagine this is for a small uh, age group, so we don't need to worry about age or experience. And we get this uh, simple uh, relationship with a single uh, coefficient on schooling of beta. In this case, the variance of log earnings, this inequality measure we just showed you, uh, is, a, is a simple function of the variance in years of schooling and the squared uh, returns to schooling and then a residual term. Uh, so we can do this decomposition where we have total variance, the explained variance, and then a residual variance. If we do that for Brazil and South Africa, it looks like this. Here's the explained component for Brazil. Here's the explained component for South Africa. And the important thing here is, for example, that Brazil's decline in earnings inequality uh, is traced by the decline in uh, explained uh, inequality. So something about returns to schooling and the variance of schooling uh, help explain uh, Brazil's decline in schooling inequality. Uh, to look at what's happened to schooling distributions, we use cumulative distributions. The important thing here is that uh, when we see a decline in the CDF, that's an unambiguous improvement, first order stochastic dominance. And when we go to 2015, we see that Brazil had steady unambiguous improvements, declining inequality, rising means uh, in the schooling distribution. And for example, the proportion was less than grade 11, which is completion of secondary, 
fell from 78% to 49% between 1995 and 2015. Look at South Africa. Uh, we also see the same unambiguous improvement in the schooling distribution uh, over the same period. So for example, the proportion with less than grade 12, which is secondary in uh, South Africa fell from 73% in 95 to 59% uh, in 2015. If we compare the two countries in 2015, there's South Africa, there's Brazil. South Africa has a better uh, distribution of education up until grade 12, at which point Brazil uh, actually has the better distribution. So South Africa is doing better at getting people to 9, 10, and 11, uh, but conditional in that South Africa, uh, Brazil actually gets more of them uh, to grade 12 uh, or grade 11, which is completion of secondary uh, and beyond. We can also just compare the mean and standard deviation. Here's the means. Uh, there's Brazil, there's South Africa. South Africa has had higher mean schooling uh, since the end of apartheid and continues to. There's the standard deviation, which is very related to uh, earnings inequality. And we can see that they were very similar around the end of apartheid. Uh, South Africa has actually declined more than uh, Brazil. So again, the question, why isn't this translating into declining earnings inequality? If we want a measure of inequality in schooling, we use some mean adjusted measure like the coefficient of variation, standard deviation divided by the mean. We can see that it's been declining consistently in both countries and is lower in South Africa. So South Africa actually has lower inequality in schooling. Both of them have big declines. And the question is, why aren't these declines in inequality in schooling translating into declines in inequality in earnings in South Africa? So to return to the simple Mensa relationship with the linear term of uh, just one single coefficient for returns to schooling uh, for every level of schooling, well, we know that's not uh, realistic. And in fact, returns to schooling are not typically constant across years of schooling. So for example, in South Africa, here's the returns to a single year of schooling for secondary and above. You can see it's uh, over 25% uh, and rising up to almost 35%, very high returns to each year of schooling uh, starting at grade 12. Here's returns to 9 to 11. They're considerably lower, though still quite high, around 15%, but going down steadily. So the returns are not the same at different levels of schooling, and they've changed very differently. So a big divergence between returns to post-secondary and returns to less than secondary. In Brazil, we also see that returns to secondary and above are much higher than returns to lower levels. Uh, we see the decline in the returns to the lower levels, say 8 to 10 and 1 to 7. We see relatively flat returns uh, to secondary and above, which is a big difference from South Africa and is going kind to of play a big role in our story here. <clears throat> so how could we model this much more general relationship? Well, imagine just a dummy for every single year of schooling, a return to schooling for every year of that. This should have a J here. Um, so there's a, a, a level of earnings associated with every year of schooling, a dummy variable for every one of them. Imagine, think of that as returns to schooling differing at every year of schooling. When you calculate the variance of law of earnings, it looks fairly complicated. It's this. But in fact, when you take the derivative of that with respect to a single beta, say earnings at grade three, earnings at grade eight, earnings at grade 12, you get a very simple relationship here, very simple expression. And it depends on something very intuitive here, which is the difference between law of earnings at that grade level, say eight or 11, and overall mean log earnings. So basically it says if this is a level of schooling associated with higher than average earnings, uh, like 12 or 13 or above, uh, then raising earnings at that level of schooling is gonna increase inequality. But if it's a level that's below that, raising earnings is actually gonna decrease inequality, which makes sense. If you raise the returns to having third grade, uh, that's actually gonna decrease inequality, not increase inequality because third graders uh, typically have uh, below average uh, earnings. So the point is, it's not as simple as does raising returns to schooling increase or decrease inequality. It's going to depend on what level of schooling that is. Uh, and that's going to depend on the difference between earnings at that school level and the overall mean. Uh, and the magnitude is going to depend on this uh, proportion at that level of schooling. So if there's a lot of people at grade eight and you change earnings at grade eight, whatever sign this has is going to have a bigger impact on overall variance of log earnings. Okay, this is just a result for the variance of log earnings, but we could do the same thing for other measures of inequality, either analytically, which works for some of them, or we're just gonna simulate it in other cases. In general, this crossover 
or changing earnings at a given level of schooling either increases or decreases inequality is always going to be a level at which divides the increasing from the decreasing, and that's going to differ for different measures of schooling. Okay, so here's a measure that comes out of that then. This is the education level of mean log earnings. Uh, we just calculate that um, kind of brute force in the data. You can see that in South Africa, that used to be nine years. It's now up to over 11 and a half years. We can compare that to mean schooling. It's actually above it everywhere. And that's because the returns to schooling are convex. So what this means is if you take uh, increasing the returns to grades 10 to 11, say, what if people at that age had the increase in their earnings relative to everybody else? That would have been disequalizing back in this period. Uh, that would have been e uh, disequalizing because those are relatively rich people. Uh, but if you did it now, it would actually be equalizing because those are people uh, below the mean log earnings. Or to put it another way, if you decreased returns to say having 10 years of schooling, which is what's happened, um, that would have been uh, equalizing back in this period because those were relatively rich people. Now those are relatively poor people. So that actually decreases, um, that actually increases inequality. Okay, so remember what's happened is returns have gone up here at 12 plus and they're very high and they've gone down at nine to 11. So this now would have been equalizing uh, in the past, but now it's actually disequalizing because these are relatively lower income people and these are the relatively higher income people. Okay, for Brazil, um, we have it for a longer period. Uh, this cross, this crossover point actually goes all the way to three and a half years, rises up to almost 11 years. Uh, the point of uh, level of schooling where mean log earnings is reached. Um, this crossover here uh, indicates that the return, this is the uh, mean, actual mean schooling. Um, this actually means that returns to schooling have switched from being concave to convex, which uh, we have seen. Um, and to take another example here, if you take grade eight, would raising earnings at grade eight compared to everybody else be equalizing or disequalizing? Well, it would have been disequalizing uh, back until about 2000 because that was a relatively high uh, income above uh, the mean log earnings. Uh, but if you did it now, uh, it would actually be equalizing. If you raised earnings at grade eight, uh, it would be equalizing because those are now below the, the level of education and mean log earnings. So that's what we're interested in. Uh, recall that what's happened in Brazil is, in fact, those eight to 10 levels have gone down. And so that would now be a disequalizing rather than equalizing. So what we do is we uh, just simulate this by taking the data at giving a 1% increase in schooling in earnings to every different level of schooling. So grade three gets a 1% increase. Then we do it again. We do grade eight. We see what happens to inequality. When these are below the line, it means that increasing earnings at those grades decreases inequality, which makes sense. Those are relatively poor people. When they're above the line, it means that increasing earnings at those grades increases inequality. Those are relatively rich people. And there's always a crossover, and the crossover varies by different inequality measures. So for example, an increase in returns of grade 11 would have actually increased the log uh, uh, variance, uh, but, de um, but decreased uh, the generalized entropy one or the tile T. So it, uh, here's the log variance, it's actually increasing it, and here's the tile T, it's actually decreasing it. Okay, when you go forward to 2011, things have changed, all these crossovers have moved over to the right. Uh, we're now at a point here where grade 11 uh, would actually, uh, an increase there would decrease inequality, um, and uh, that's a change from the past, and all these have gone up quite a lot. Okay. If we compare Brazil and South Africa, uh, there's some important differences here. You can see up in here, uh, these grade 12, 13, 14, these are way above the uh, zero line in uh, South Africa, indicating that uh, there's a much bigger disequalizing effect of increasing returns to these post-secondary level. These are below the line, much more so than in uh, Brazil. So increasing uh, returns at grade 11 uh, would have actually been equalizing, or put another way, the decreases in returns, which is what's actually happened, uh, would now be disequalizing and by a much greater degree uh, than in Brazil. So what do we learn from this? Schooling and inequality declined substantially over time in both countries. This led to uh, decreasing inequality in Brazil, but not in South Africa. A lot of that's because of what's happened to returns to schooling. Uh, so returns to schooling increased at high levels in South Africa. They declined at low and intermediate levels, whereas Brazil had much smaller levels 
a much smaller increase in returns of schooling at the top. We're very interested in what happened in the middle here, and we see this interesting result that these decreases in returns in the middle of the schooling distribution, rather than reducing inequality, they've actually increased inequality because those are actually people who are below uh, the mean earnings in the, in the overall uh, economy. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, David. And we're now going to load the next video presentation by Monica lambon you from the University of Ghana. I'd like to remind everyone that questions that you may have can be posed in the Q&A box um, at the bottom of the screen. And then we'll, we'll ask these to the, to the speakers at the end of the, of the session. So can we have the second video presentation, please? Thank you. Hello everyone. Today, my presentation is on understanding the relationship between economic inequality, inequality of opportunity and education outcomes in Ghana. So appreciate the inequality debate, which centers around the question of whether or not inequality is acceptable, it's important for us to understand the main sources of inequality. Now there are two sources of inequality. The first um, part or the first source of inequality is based on the capabilities or efforts that people put into economic activities. And this is generally seen, um, deemed to be desirable. There's also the second part, which is based on people's, um, which is based on factors that are beyond the control of individuals. So you can have instances where individuals put in the same effort, but come out with different economic outcomes due to characteristics that are seen to be exogenous. So for instance, you can have children starting off at the same point, putting in the same efforts, but their economic outcomes might be different based on characteristics such as their gender, their parents' education, their location of residence, their ethnicity, their race, or their religion. So it is this kind of inequality which is based on exogenous circumstances that is described as inequality of opportunity. And this kind of inequality, according to the World Bank, is considered to be unfair and unjust. So this unfair and unjust inequality of opportunity has the potential to harm long-term economic growth and social stability if nothing is done to reduce or check it. Now there's empirical evidence that also shows that inequality of opportunity has or is capable of um, facilitating the intergenerational persistence of inequality as well as social mobility. When it comes to available evidence that looks at the relationship between economic inequality and education outcomes, that is very limited. The few studies that have been conducted are mainly based on more advanced countries such as the US and other countries from the OECD block. When it comes to um, the evidence that exists when we look at the relationship between economic inequality and, ed and education outcomes, it's particularly very scanty for sub-Saharan African countries. In terms of our research questions, what we hope to um, do in this particular paper is to determine the contribution of inequality of opportunity in explaining consumption inequality in Ghana between 2010 and 2014. We also would um, want to determine the exogenous factors that influence inequality of opportunity in Ghana. The other part of our research question also seeks to determine the contribution of inequality of opportunity in explaining inequality in education, as well as determining the driving factors or the factors that influence inequality of opportunity when it comes to education outcomes in Ghana. Now, the other part of our uh, research question is focused on investigating the effect of consumption inequality on education outcomes. And beyond this, we also go ahead to determine whether inequality of opportunity mediates the relationship between inequality of consumption inequality and learning outcomes using data at the in individual level. To be able to answer these research questions, we use the Ghana Socioeconomic Panel Survey. In this particular study, we rely on the first two waves, which um, is from 2010 to 2014. And this particular data set has very detailed information on demographic characteristics of households 
education, health, employment, and other important variables that are useful uh, for this particular analysis. The main variables of interest for the dependent variables are math and English test scores, which were uh, a test that were administered to children with, within the ages of five to 15 years. Now, the other um, independent variable of interest is household consumption expenditure deviations, which we use in this study as a proxy for consumption inequality. In terms of methodology, we, 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 we employ different methodology based on the research question. So to be able to determine the inequality of opportunity for Ghana, we use a parametric approach developed by Ferreira and Genu in 2011. So basically what we do is to run an OLS regression that um, controls for a, a, a set of exogenous circumstances, which is represented by the CI. And the phi here represents the coefficient of interest. So beyond running the regression, what we do is to employ the Shapley decomposition method that was developed by Shorox in 1982 to isolate the contribution of each of the exogenous factors that influences inequality of opportunity generally, and that's for education as well. The other part of the research question employs a random effects model that looks at the relationship between um, household expenditure deviations with um, education outcomes. So here, the beta two is the main um, coefficient of interest. The other part of the research question that seeks to determine whether or not inequality of opportunity mediates the relationship between consumption inequality and education outcomes. We employ the path analysis that is found in the um, SEM framework. So here, we want to be able to disentangle the total effect into direct effect and indirect effect. So the direct effect of um, consumption on education outcomes is represented by the red arrow and we also acknowledge that consumption inequality can affect education outcomes in, indirectly by going through or working through the inequality of opportunity. So the indirect effect will be captured by the blue and the um, green arrows that we see in this di particular diagram. So this shows, this slide shows the um, summary characteristics. So here, the main, as I mentioned earlier, math test scores and English test scores are the main um, dependent variables and then the consumption inequality here is a proxy that we use. Um, the uh, household expenditure deviations are the is a proxy for consumption inequality. Then we also control for different characteristics, particularly the exogenous characteristics, such as the, the, the type of school that the child attends, the educational level of parents, the, and whether the child has access to all test books or not. So this slide shows us the uh, main results. So this one is first focusing on the inequality of consumption inequality between 2010 and 2014. And from what we can see, between 2010 and 2014, we do see that the inequality of opportunity has almost doubled from 4.3% in 2010 to about 8.1% in 2014. And, and, and this is quite interesting because particularly for um, this particular period, there were a number of um, social policies or social interventions that were put in place to be able to reduce inequality. But yet we still see that the inequality of opportunity increases um, within that period. We do the same for math, math achievement. And between 2010 and 2014, we do see that there's no difference or there's no change in the inequality of opportunity for math achievement. However, we do see the differences in um, contributing uh, exogenous factors. So for instance, we see that in 20, between 2010 and 2014, the contribution of gender to inequality of math achievement increases significantly from 1% to about 22%. We also see that parental presence reduces from 31% to about 9% in 2014. The, we, see the, we see the importance of father's education and mother's education as well as um, school type. We do the same for English achievement. And we do see that between 2010 and 2014, the um, contribution of inequality of opportunity to total English achievement inequality reduces from 9.4% to about um, 6% in 2014. We see the importance of the contribution of parental presence, father's education, even though that reduces from 28% to 2% in 2014. 
and we also see the importance of um, the type of school that the child attend, uh, attends in explaining the inequality of opportunity when it comes to English ach achievement. There's also, so this particular um, slide shows us the results for the path analysis. So again, as we saw in the diagram under the methodology slide, we see that the red arrow, which is capturing the effect of consumption inequality on math scores in this particular slide, we see that um, it's not significant. When we look at the indirect effect of consumption inequality and its effect on inequality of opportunity represented by the blue um, rectangular box, we see that in the consumption inequality significantly affects inequality of opportunity. And when we look at the green um, box, that also looks at the relationship between inequality of opportunity and um, education outcomes. And we do see that father's education and children's access to textbooks are important determinants of um, math, math achievement. So when we put these two together, um, we get the indirect effect of consumption inequality on math scores. And that is what is captured by the mustard color. And we do see that this is negative and significant at the 1% level. So what this means is that inequality of opportunity is mediating the um, effect of consumption inequality on math achievement. We do the same thing for English test scores. And we see that the direct effect, which is captured by the red um, coefficient, as we see on this slide, is negative, but not significant. And again, we see significant effects of consumption inequality on inequality of opportunity. And we still see that um, inequality of opportunity, which is represented by characteristics such as father's education, locality, and these are important determinants of English um, achievement. Again, if we look at the indirect effect, which is captured by the mustard um, color, we do see that consumption inequality affects um, English achievement indirectly through um, the inequality of opportunity. So this means that inequality of opportunity is mediating the relationship between consumption inequality and um, math achieve, English achievement in, in this case. So just to give a summary of the results, we see that inequality of opportunity contributes very significantly to total inequality in Ghana. And this increases from 4.3% to about 8.1% in 2014. We see that the main drivers of inequality of opportunity is um, region of birth and educational attainment of parents. We also see that the drivers of inequality of educational opportunity is parental presence, presence, uh, and parents' education, school type, as well as, as well as region of residence. And our results from the path analysis also shows that inequality of opportunity mediates the effect of consumption inequality, um, the, the effect of consumption inequality on education outcomes. So what this means is that inequality of opportunity in itself is important in explaining the differences in education outcomes that we see. So by way of recommendation and conclusion, what the study says here is that policy making on inequality should go beyond developing individuals' capabilities and effort and focus more on implementing policies that improve access to education and also uh, ensuring that this um, creates Implementing such policies creates the potential to shape the opportunities that the current generation would present to their children in the future. And currently, we do have the, the free SHS policy, and it's important for us to review this policy to ensure that it has the quality that we desire and is also sustainable in the future. Overall, it's also important to be more deliberate about the distribution of social infrastructure and economic resources across the various regions just to ensure that there's equality of opportunity irrespective of where one finds themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this, Monica. We'll now have the third presentation by Daniela Albina from Princeton University, a paper titled Mass Education and Women's Autonomy in Latin America. I'm just I'm a reiteration that if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A box um, below and we're happy to present them to the speakers at the end of the session. Um, thank you. And then can we have the video now? Hi, welcome. My name is Daniel 
Rubina. I'm a PhD candidate in sociology and social policy at Princeton University. And today I will be presenting my work titled Mass Education and Women's Autonomy, Evidence from Latin America. So in Latin America, women have either equalized or surpassed men's educational attainment in the last few decades. As you can see in this graph, um, that shows the gap years of education over time across birth cohorts. Uh, yeah, the increase in women's education has been dramatic. And now in several countries, we find actually a female advantage in education. Now, education has been theorized to increase women's autonomy and decision-making in families. And this was an important hypothesis because it connected uh, the promotion of mass education to uh, a reduction in fertility size, for example. Uh, currently, sev today, several NGOs and aid, ag aid agencies promote girls' schooling as an empowerment tool. Now, I wanna argue that this relationship hasn't been um, sufficiently studied, uh, and I will do that today. But first, I want to define precisely what I mean with autonomy. Um, and so I follow the demographic literature and define uh, women's autonomy as the ability to execute decisions regarding her personal affairs and those concerning close family members. So what do we know of the relationship between women's education and autonomy? Um, the literature, I would say, present mixed findings. While some studies shows that education is associated with women's greater autonomy in households, and this evidence is from um, countries in the global south and including Latin America, Others uh, find it's non-consequential, really. Um, but it's important to say that it's unclear whether these findings or, and this mixed findings especially are due to the treatment of an increase of education or other unobserved processes, such as the, the selection into schooling in the first place. Similarly, uh, prior studies have focused on married women, which uh, substantively makes sense because in a way autonomy is kind of a negotiated outcome with um, husbands in many instances, uh, but focusing only on married women tends to introduce further selection biases. Um, so in this project, I'm going to include the universe of women and then explore um, women uh, sort of family formation as a pathway. Okay, so this, the, my study, uh, I uh, answer three research questions. First, um, what is the effect of mass schooling on women's autonomy? Then, does the impact of schooling vary according to students' backgrounds? So, for example, if they come from rural backgrounds or their ethnicity and so on. Third, are changes in women's uniformation a potential pathway through which education affects um, autonomy? Now, this is only one potential pathway among many others, but um, this is of substantive interest, I think, for demographic literatures. Um, and so I'm going to answer these questions in the empirical case of Bolivia, Colombia, and Peru. Uh, and in this presentation, I'm mostly going to focus on the answer from the first question, but I'm happy to talk about my findings regarding uh, questions two and three. So what are mere theoretical expectations coming to this project? So on the one hand, modernization approaches sort of argue that mass education is an effective tool to diffuse the values and motivations associated with development. And as I said before, this was an important hypothesis in, the, in sociology and demography. The idea was that mass schooling was gonna sort of promote uh, independence from parental authority, a greater ambition for oneself, and women's emancipation from subordinate roles. And the diffusion of these values was going to take place, for example, via textbooks that are going to be gender egalitarian, via interactions with female teachers, uh, but all, and also sort of via uh, sort of cognitive tools that women would gain to make decisions. And of course, via sort of uh, gains in economic earnings and, and you know, a, a greater participation in the labor market. Now, others have a more skeptical approach. And I guess this approach is share the idea that on the ground, masculine looks quite different, in, especially in context of Latin America. So for example, scholars have found a continuous enforcement of gender biases in schools. There's also persistent low quality of educational institutions. Um, and finally, there's also uh, contextual implications. So family in rural regions tend to 
resist women's education. And this has been the case in Latin American countries as well. Uh, so this, I think this, this set of sort of situations also uh, makes us think that maybe education is not uh, such an effective empowerment tool on the other hand, right? Um, okay, so before I go into the data and findings, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about my empirical cases. So in Bolivia, Colombia, Colombia and Peru, um, there was implementation of compulsory schooling laws in the 1990s that established a minimum of school years that must be attained. Uh, and the goal then was to achieve universal primary schooling. Now, the special target of these policies was actually to reduce the significant sort of urban rural gaps in those countries. And in the case of Bolivia and Peru, especially the gender gap in education favoring boys. It's important to say that the case of Colombia is a bit different in that sense. Um, in the 1990s, uh, women already had a pretty similar level of education as, as boys. This table uh, sort of summarizes the reforms and their nature. So as you can see, most of them were implemented between 1991 and 1994. And in the case of Bolivia, they increased the years of schooling from five to eight years, while in Colombia, Peru, from five to 10. My data and methods. So the data I'm gonna use here is gonna be pooled with repeat, repeated cross-sectional data from the DHS collected between 2000 and 2006. I'm using all the available waves, but from Bolivia, there's there are much the three waves I'm using um, only. Uh, the analytical sample is going to include women who were between 20 to 49 years old at the time of the survey. Sadly, uh, men in the sample did not answer the outcome questions I am using. I would love to have them in the study, but I can't. Uh, it's also important to say that the sample includes women in different household arrangements, uh, and so around 75% are gonna be women that are married or cohabitating, and the rest are mostly women that live with parents. And then in terms of outcomes, right, uh, I'm gonna use a series of questions about who takes the decision about health, earnings, movement, and household purchases. I'm gonna take those questions and use them as separate items, and also uh, to construct an autonomy scale. Uh, but the idea here is that we're gonna sort of classify women as being autonomous if they take place they take, they have some power decision making in each of these items, either alone or with a partner or parent. Happy to talk more about the measures in the Q&A. And then in terms of methods, I'm gonna use two main strategies. First, I'm just gonna examine the association between years of education and women's autonomy and how this association changes across birth cohorts that are exposed to different levels of expansion. Uh, and then the second methods is I'm gonna use a birth cohort of, of my respondents as an instrument to encourage years of education via exposure to school reforms. So I'm gonna say a little bit more about that. Um, so basically I'm using birth cohorts as an instrument for total years of schooling. And I'm gonna use a two-stage lead squares estimation strategy. As you can see here in the first equation, we're gonna use a dummy variable that uh, identifies if you were exposed or not exposed to these reforms when you were in school and then how that exposure is gonna impact your years of total years of schooling. And then in a second equation, we, we take the predictor years of schooling and we'll see how those years of schooling then impact the outcome. These models are gonna control for survey year, region, ethnicity, and include robust standard errors cluster by survey cluster. So going to the main findings, um, so this is a bit of an overwhelming table. Um, this table is showing uh, OLS models between women's education and the autonomy scale. So I think there are two main takeaways. So first, in all countries, we see a positive relationship between years of education and autonomy, right? Um, coefficients are in standard deviations in this case because of the scale. Now, the second model of in each country then includes birth cohorts and interactions between birth cohorts and education. And we can see that while the, the association between years of education and autonomy is positive, um, this positive return sort of diminish uh, with, old, with younger birth cohorts. So in a way, as systems, educational system expands, the return in terms of autonomy, um, the returns of education in terms of autonomy decreases. 
exactly. So, yeah, as I was saying, the positive returns of schooling for women's empowerment tend to diminish over time. So that is already saying us um, something relevant about this relationship. So now we're going to look more into the causal effect of masculine and women's autonomy using um, IV. Now, first, it's very important that I show you that, uh, in fact, being exposed to expansion reforms actually increase your years of education. So um, this table here shows a positive and robust effect of being exposed to reforms on years of education. So for example, in Bolivia, students that were um, exposed increased almost half a year in terms of schooling. Um, and so the app tests are robust and, and the coefficients are significant. So therefore, uh, this is a solid instrument to be, to be used in this analysis. So these are the main results of the IV estimates. Um, as you can see, we have the autonomy scale and then we have separate items. So the first thing to note is that in all countries, an extra year of education uh, diminishes um, the autonomy of women. And this effect is especially feasible in the case of Peru um, and also in Bolivia, but in Bolivia it's not statistically significant. Um, this negative relationship can also be observed uh, if we look at the separate items, for example. Uh, so for example, um, there's a diminishing in the decision making in terms of household purchases in all countries, in terms of um, autonomy in visits, and also especially, I think, important in terms of uh, who decides about healthcare. Um, definitely, so I was very surprised with these results, uh, but, but as I will show you, they're robust to a number of uh, robustness checks. So summary of my findings. So first, we find there's a positive association between women's schooling and greater autonomy, uh, but this relationship decreases as educational systems expand, and we, we see that in OLS models. Now then, if we look at the causal relationship, uh, IV estimates shows that the cohorts of women exposed to compulsory laws experience actually a decrease in their autonomy and decision making. Now, it is very important to say here that these findings indicate that the local average treatment effect of an extra year of schooling uh, among compliers of compulsory schooling. Um, so this means that it's not, an, it's among those students that complied and, and stay in the system because of compulsory laws, we find this negative effect. So what that is what we call the local average treatment effect, right? Um, it's also important to say that this uh, finding is robust to different definitions of exposure. So birth cohorts that are included or not in the, in the um, regression and also to partial exposure. So for example, students that um, have great repetition or so on. Moreover, in my study, I didn't, I didn't show this because of time, but I also find that um, compliers to compulsory laws were much more likely to come from rural backgrounds or identify as indigenous. So it seems that the negative effect is focused on those populations, especially in those two countries. And I also find uh, in subsequent analyses that union formation is actually a relevant pathway to explain these findings. And, and so just a small preview, but I find that women that have extra years of education are less likely to, to marry in all countries. And then amongst those who marry, actually they're more prone to marry down in education. So um, marry men that have less years of schooling, which in the, con in the context is kind of a violation to marriage market norms. Um, I think this last finding contributes to a prior scholarship that shows that status inconsistent unions uh, are prone to gender backlash dynamics. Um, so in a way, uh, what I'm finding here, this, this sort of negative effect of autonomy may be explained on the one hand to changes in the selection to schooling, right? As the systems expand, um, different students from different backgrounds are coming to the educational system and maybe they're not the tools or the infrastructure necessary um, to, to have effective changes in terms of their autonomy and so on later in life. Uh, but it could also be that similarly that women that are gaining schooling sort of are violating certain um, gender norms in the context. And therefore, uh, those that get married actually and, and marry down 
um, experience a decrease of autonomy, partly as a compensatory response uh, of that violation in terms of marriage marking. So that's all I have for you today. I hope that I, I'm good on time. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, that Daniela. And then we will have the final presentation now by Jessica Miranda, and she's from Bocconi University. The title of her paper is An Aspiring Friend is a Friend Indeed, School Peers and College Aspira Aspirations in Brazil. Jessica, I'm a PhD candidate at Bocconi University. Today I'm going to talk about my job market paper, where I investigate peer effects on students' aspirations. So aspiration is a very uh, fundamental determinant of human capital accumulation. For instance, in this uh, theoretical model by Jenny Coin Ray, they show that as long as individuals do not perceive their aspirations as something unattainable, the more they aspire to have in the future, the harder they work in the present, and the more investments they make. Jenny Coin Ray and also some other authors show how individuals' aspirations emerge in social contexts when individuals compare themselves to similar others. And uh, there have been some empirical works that show how my peer socioeconomic status influence my aspirations. So basically, the more my peers have, the more I also want to have. Uh, but I think that another important question is on whether my peers' aspirations influence my aspirations above and beyond socioeconomic characteristics. So for instance, if we have two people in the same socioeconomic status, but one of them aspired to have more, how the interaction between them will uh, shape their aspirations? Uh, sociologists have already shown for quite a long time a positive association between a uh, person's aspirations and the aspirations of their friends. However, when it comes to causality, there are some challenges in the estimation of peer effects. The first one is that all peers are embedded in the same environment and subject to common shocks. Uh, and then the second one is that even within our environment, we have endogenous formation of friendship. I think everybody has the sense that we don't just pick our friends at random. There are very specific reasons why we choose our friends. And homophily, which is people's characteristic to connect with similar others. So homophily is a very important determinant of friendship formation. Finally, we also have the reflection problem. Or basically, this is basically a simultaneity that happens because I influence my friends, but my friends influence me at the same time. So it's hard sometimes to disentangle who is influencing whom. So in this paper, I basically estimate peer effects on students' college aspiration, which is students' willingness to pursue a college degree in the future. For that, I leverage social network data collected in uh, some middle school students in Brazil. And I'm going to acknowledge all the problems that I've just mentioned, and I use a quite novel methodology in order to estimate causal peer effects. So the data for this work come from a survey that was uh, conducted in uh, students in the ninth grade in some state-owned schools in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And this is a very comprehensive questionnaire about students' personal profile, how happy or satisfied they were with their lives, and also their aspirations for the future. I think one of those questions uh, to build my main variable of interest, which I call college aspiration. This is a binary variable that would take value equal one if a student said that they would like to keep studying until they have a college degree. A very important part of the survey that actually allows me to implement the methodology that I'm using is that I have information on students' friendship ties in their grade. So each student were asked to nominate their four best friends or colleagues in the grade. And with that, I'm able to map students' connection for all ninth grade in each school. And this is usually more than one classroom. I'm also able to merge this survey with administrative data and to recover, for instance, um, information on whether, for instance, students drop out from school in the future. So the identification of peer effects, as I said, is a bit uh, challenging. And uh, the methodology that I use to address those challenges uh, is uh, quite long. Uh, here, I'm going to give you the big picture of this methodology. And I'm happy to talk more into details on the Q&A. 
But let's start with a model of friends influence where my outcomes will depend on the average outcomes of my friends, on my own characteristics, and on the average characteristics of my friends. Here in this second equation, I'm basically just translating this first equation into matrix notation, where I introduce G, the adjacency matrix, and each element IJ of this matrix will take value equal one if the student I sends a friendship tie to student J and zero otherwise. So if you're not familiar with social network notation, not a problem. The only thing you have to know in order to follow uh, my slides here is that if G maps the friendship connections, G square will map friends of friends, and G to the third level will map friends of friends of friends. So now let's go to each of the challenges in estimating pure effects and how I'm going to address them. The first challenge are the unobservable environmental components or common shots that peers uh, are subject to because they're all in the same environment. So for instance, students self-select into schools and um, school quality might be correlated with their aspirations. And even within a school in classrooms, there might be some uh, competition or social norms that make people that are not exactly my friends also influence my aspirations. So uh, this is the most straightforward problem to address. I'm just going to control for school and classroom fixed effects. Then we, we have the reflection problem. And it's easy to see how it emerges because we have Y in both sides of this equation here. So basically, again, I influence my friends and my friends influence me back. How to disentangle who is influencing whom? In order to address this uh, challenge, I'm going to borrow from the work of Ramulet and co-authors, and the Georgi and co-authors, and I'm going to uh, basically explore the fact that not everybody is connected to everybody else in the network, and I'm going to use friends of friends characteristics as instrumental variables for friends aspirations. So basically, the idea here, let's take a look at this toy model that I have, toy network that I have here, where uh, Tina, for instance, is connected to Anna, and Anna is connected to Lisa, but Lisa is not connected to Tina. So Lisa will influence Tina only through the influence that she has on Anna. If this is the case, I'm able to use Lisa's characteristics as instrumental variables for Anna's aspirations, and as such, to identify the impact that Anna's aspirations have on Tina's aspirations. So all of this would be enough if we did not have endogenous link formation or endogenous formation of friendship. But the main problem here is that there might be a very specific reason why Tina is friends with Anna, but it's not, it's not friends with Lisa. If this is the case, then my instruments themselves would be endogenous. Uh, and in order to address this problem, I'm going to borrow from the work of Connie and co-authors, and basically I'm going to implement a step before building my instrument. And this step uh, is um, modeling network formation based on uh, homophily in predetermined characteristics and also on random chances that students have to interact in the school. So maybe it's easier if I just go ahead and show you the model, um, and I, I would explain um, in the meantime. So here we have uh, each observation of this model is a potential link. So basically two students in a school, whether they are friends or not. And uh, then, the, so this is the raw estimation and those are the odds ratio. Uh, so for, for any two students in, in a school, if both of them are the same gender, this increases the likelihood that they're going to be friends. Also, if both of them are white and if both of them are black. Also, if both of them share the first name initial, so basically the first letter of their name. Why this is the case? Basically because, so here we are looking at students in ninth grade in 2011. When, back in 2008, when those students were in the sixth grade, they had to change from municipal to state-owned schools. And uh, when they change schools, uh, those schools don't have any kind of information about their background. So they are allocated within uh, classrooms, basically in, alphabet in alphabetical order uh, of, of their first name. So if they share their first, the, the first letter of their uh, name, they uh, have more chance of being allocated in the same classroom during sixth grade. And in all grades, uh, within classroom allocation, sometimes also uh, based on alphabetical order of those students. So teachers 
uh, allocate students into the ERC given their first name. So also, again, they have more chance of interacting if they share their first letter of their name. And it's true that if they, they share their first name initials, they have a higher likelihood of being friends. So after estimating this model, what I do is to take the predicted links coming from this model. And instead of using friends of friends characteristics as instrumental uh, variables for friends aspirations, I use the predicted friends of friends characteristics as instrumental variables for friends aspirations. So just to sum up, this is a three-step estimation that I do. First, I will estimate network formation based on similarities in predetermined characteristics. Then I'm going to get the predicted adjacency metrics. And the, two, the second and third stage of this model is a normal two-stage least square, where I'm going to use the predicted friends of friends characteristics as instrumental variables for friends aspirations. And I'm also going to control for uh, school and classroom fixed effects. So going to the results now, the only difference between those three columns is, uh, are my instruments. So here I'm basically using friends of friends character, no, sorry, the predicted friends of friends characteristics. Here I'm using the predicted friends of friends of friends, and here I'm using both of them. And we see that the results are pretty similar. So basically, if we look at this first column here, we see that if a student goes from having uh, zero of his nominated friends to having all of his nominated friends aspiring to go to college, the likelihood that this student will also aspire to go to college increases in 15.3 percentage points. So this is a quite high uh, impact, but also it's very unlikely that someone will go from having zero to having all of their friends aspiring to go to college. Uh, on average, students um, nominated only two friends, and uh, maybe a more intuitive way of thinking of these results is to think of the impact of one extra aspiring friend. So if one of, uh, if I have another friend that wants to go to college, how is this going to influence my likelihood to go to college? So for the average student, uh, this represents more or less an increase of 11.25% uh, in my aspiration. Uh, I'm not, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go too much into details on the mechanism, but uh, what I can tell is that I also check that if my friends put more effort in school, I am also going to put more effort in school. Also, if my friends comply to some negative social norms in school, I'm also going to do that. So those might be some mechanisms going on here. And finally, I look at uh, some future outcomes of those students, and I see how their friends' aspirations influence those future outcomes. So while I do not find uh, results, for instance, in their performance in the future, I do find that their friends' aspirations decrease the likelihood that they will drop out from school. So just to conclude, I think uh, the important policy implication of this work is that we have several interventions that raise students' aspirations. Uh, in my work, I'm showing that those interventions actually spill over even to students that were not directly targeted by them. Uh, also, the fact that I find that friends' aspirations decrease college, uh, sorry, school dropout, this is a very important um, result, especially in developing countries that have very high dropout rates during high school. So that's it. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer the questions uh, during the Q&A. Thank you very much for that, Jessica. Okay, so we will now have discuss and comments on each of the papers that have been presented. So I would like to call on Jessica um, again to present her five minutes discuss and comments on the first paper that was presented on schooling inequality, returns to schooling and earnings inequality, evidence from Brazil and South Africa. Jessica, you have the floor. Sure. Yeah, so it was really nice uh, reading that paper. I think I learned a lot and I really enjoyed it. The main idea of the paper is to analyze, um, so it's to analyze the interactions of schooling inequality, returns to schooling and earning inequality, shedding light, especially in the fact that schooling returns differ across, uh, sorry, differ according to level of schooling. 
Uh, so I think one of the things that I liked the most about the paper was the fact that it introduces a very interesting summary statistic, which is basically the year of schooling, which separates equalizing from disequalizing increases in returns to schooling. I think this is, uh, will be a very useful tool for other works uh, in inequality. And also the paper explains in a very uh, intuitive way why earnings inequality have decreased in Brazil, but not in South Africa. Uh, if both countries, for instance, saw a decrease in their uh, education inequality. Uh, I think the main idea of the paper is to show that South Africa had an increase in returns to schooling at the top of the schooling uh, distribution and a decrease in returns to school at the lower levels of schooling distribution. And this pattern was not seen uh, in Brazil. So just uh, something that I would like to see uh, maybe is how this analysis would look like for other countries and other contexts, especially, for instance, developed countries like in the US, where they have high levels of inequality, but also, um, for instance, they have more uh, people completing secondary school. And actually, this uh, leads to my second point, which is that you perform the analysis up to 15 years of education. Uh, and I think that would be nice to have more years uh, included in the analysis, just to be sure that you are detecting uh, returns from having higher education uh, diploma. So for instance, in Brazil, most universities courses uh, last four years, but some of them, and perhaps the ones with higher levels, uh, sorry, higher returns uh, from, from uh, schooling would be, uh, for instance, engineering and medicine, and those last more years, for instance, uh, five or six. So it would, uh, like the, the years of education would be more than, than 15 uh, in this case. And then I think just like a, a clarification that I would need is that for me, it was not very clear why you defined um, secondary school completion in Brazil with 11 years, because our secondary schooling goes up to 12 years. Uh, so the, the uh, grade 12. So it's true that it changed it, but before we also have a, a pre uh, schooling year of education. So I didn't understand exactly how uh, how you came up with these uh, 11 years of schooling, but this I think is just like a doubt more than anything else. Uh, apart from that, I really, I really enjoyed the paper and um, yeah, I learned a lot reading it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. I would now like to call on David Lam to present his comments on the second paper on understanding the relationship between economic inequality and inequality of opportunity and education outcomes in Ghana. You have a maximum of five minutes for this, please. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Well, I really enjoyed uh, reading this paper. Um, uses some great panel data and uses the two waves of the data. Uh, looking at this idea of um, inequality of opportunity and how it's affecting um, school outcomes, in particular test scores, which is great to see the data on the on the test scores. So <clears throat> the basic idea is to get this number that's sort of the percent of inequality that's explained by these uh, characteristics like parental education, school quality, uh, this percentage, which is, for example, um, 9.4 percent of English test scores are explained by these uh, characteristics and that's what Monica in the paper referred to as unfair uh, inequality sort of inequality of opportunity um, and that declined to 5.6 percent uh, in 2015 uh, 2014. Uh, so that's a very interesting analysis. <clears throat> um, one thing I would just throw out that when you're looking at something like that it's interesting to consider that if you had for example just kind of random noise uh, introduced into these scores or something that was uncorrelated with all of these uh, outcomes for some reason, like the test just got harder or it was graded uh, more poorly or something, um, that would actually lower this percentage, um, but not in a particularly interesting way. But something to think about when you see this uh, decline over time. It could be something about the characteristics, but it could be something about just the measurement of the test and some other uncorrelated component that's uh, increasing. Then they look at the contribution of um, things like parental education to that. So for exact to take their example of father's education, it accounts for 24% of this overall 9.4% um, <clears throat> in 2010. Um, one of the things I would like to see on that is that if you think of what this contribution is, it's a combination of sort of how much inequality in father's education is there 
and how big is the impact of father's education on uh, on the children test score? Sort of exactly the same point that we were making in our paper about the earnings inequality. Um, and so it'd be nice, to, I would have liked to have seen the components. I would have liked to have seen the underlying regression and sort of something. So you can't quite tell, is this is this share high because father's education is really unequal or is it high because father's education has a really big impact uh, on children's education? And then especially when you get to the change over time, uh, which are, some of them are huge. So the impact of father's education on English test scores falls from 24% to 3%. So A, that's, so big that it would have liked to seen some discussion. It seems kind of hard to believe. Um, but then there's the question of, well, is that because inequality in father's education uh, declined? Presumably not over a four year period. So it must have been something about the, um, uh, the impact of father's education on English test scores changing a lot or something going on with all the other variables. So just would have liked to have seen something about that. Uh, then just to jump to the end of the paper, there's this path model, which is very interesting, trying to look at the direct and indirect effects of uh, consumption inequality, we could, which we could think of as uh, income inequality, basically, um, on parental education. Um, and I thought that was really interesting analysis, but I worried a little bit about whether the, uh, whether the analogy to these uh, path models and direct and indirect effects kind of work so well in this case. So. The question is, uh, ordinarily with this thing, say, is the uh, what's the direct effect of race on education sort of controlling for other things? And then what's the indirect effect that works through the effect of race on parents' education and other kinds of things? In this case, you're looking at the impact of income on children's test scores. And the idea is that it's working indirectly through an effect of parents' education. But that implies there's a path going from parental income or consumption to parental education, um, which doesn't really quite make sense to me. It seems usually we think of it going the other way around. The parents' education is affecting their income. So this kind of indirect pathway that income is affecting children's education because it's affecting parents' education and then that's affecting uh, the children just didn't quite work for me. So I, I, I think you just need to think a little bit about that. The analysis still must mean something interestingly about partial correlations and, uh, uh, and sort of the total uh, total impact and how much is there when you control for things. Uh, but I think you just maybe need to think a little bit about that part of it. But really interesting paper, really interesting analysis. And I like the, I like the whole uh, framework of it. So thanks. Thank you very much, David. I would now like to ask Monica Lambonquivio to present her discuss and comments on the third paper, Mass Education and Women's Autonomy in Latin America. Again, you'll have only a maximum of five minutes for this, Monica. All right, thank you very much, um, uh, Madam Chair. And um, yes, I so I read Daniela's paper and I thought it was very interesting because it gave us a different perspective. I mean, uh, quite a number of studies have looked at um, schooling and autonomy, but this paper gives us a different perspective, particularly because it looks at the, um, the hypergamy part. That was the part that I really liked, you know, seeing how, um, whether people are mining up or mining down. So this was one thing I really liked about that. I just have a few, um, you know, things that I wanted to bring up for maybe for you to consider as you um, finalize the paper. So um, you, you compare Bolivia, Colombia, and Peru. And in the paper, you explained that, you know, these three countries had introduced mass um, education at some point, but it wasn't very clear to me. I mean, aside the fact that they had introduced um, similar policies, it wasn't very clear to me um, why you chose these particular three countries. I was just wondering if it's possible for you to uh, maybe put something in the paper that, that highlights what makes them different or similar and so that what makes them and what brings out um, the the uh, the interesting comparison with these three countries. I thought that was um, missing in the paper, and I think that would be good to to um, add. Then, um, in terms of the sample size, you in the paper you indicated that um, the Bolivian sample is very um, small compared to the Colombia and um, Peru sample. 
So I thought maybe even for robustness checks, you could maybe drop how, uh, drop uh, Bolivia, for instance, and maybe do the analysis for Colombia and, and Peru to just see how things are so that um, you can confidently say that is not being, the results you're seeing is not being driven by the um, small sample size for Bolivia. And um, I, I wonder if the results could also be different if you, if you used a more st a stricter definition of autonomy. In your autonomy definitions, you included, um, I think you focused on women participating in the decision-making. I thought it would also be interesting to see if you only focused on the women only make, taking the decision, just to see if there's any um, difference in the, in the results. In the explanations of the, um, um, the findings, we, we found that, or you showed that um, Bolivia, I think at some point, had a negative and significant relationship, but then we didn't find any relationship for Colombia and Peru. And, and it, I thought maybe it would be good to just add the contextual explanations. Why are we finding these results for Bolivia and not for Colombia and um, Peru? My last, my last point um, has to do with um, you maybe considering looking at heterogeneous effects. Would the, would the effects be different for women who have spouses with lower or higher education? I thought maybe looking at those um, heterogeneous effects would make the paper even more interesting that, um, yeah, so these are a few of the comments that I, I, I have now. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Finally, I would like to ask Daniela to present her comments on the fourth paper that we listened to, An Aspiring Friend is a Friend Indeed, School Peers and College Aspirations in Brazil. Daniela. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for your comments, Monica. Uh, so uh, it was a pleasure to read uh, Jessica's paper on the effects of pure effects on college aspirations. Uh, so as we saw, Jessica uses uh, really interesting administrative data from Sao Paulo in Brazil and applies this three-stage least-square approach. Um, and she finds that pure aspirations significantly impact students' own college aspirations. Um, I really like that she explores a series of mechanisms and finds evidence uh, that social norms and maybe school effort practices among friend networks are kind of driving these results. Uh, so I really like that she's tackling a, a difficult problem and I really, I found the, the ID strategy really interesting. I haven't seen it before, so I learned a lot. And I also like that you went like very pedagogically through each of the identification problems and how you were like solving them. And so even for someone that doesn't, I have never done work with networks, um, it was like very, like I could follow. And so that was, that was great. Um, so I have like just two major, like two comments about how you could improve some of this. Um, and like, this is funny because Monica said the same thing to me, but uh, I think the paper would benefit from more contextual information about the empirical case and the Brazilian expansion of higher education specifically. So, um, and this is because I know that in from the 2010 and a little bit earlier, uh, higher education in Brazil has really expanded. Uh, it, it has uh, various sort of aggressive affirmative action policies uh, from the 2010. So I think probably the country and especially the cohorts that you're looking at were in school during these major changes in higher education. So could you tell us a little bit more about what was happening in terms of for those cohorts in terms of uh, higher education sort of trends. Um, and, and in a similar vein, kind of, um, could you maybe comment a little bit about to what extent the, the magnitude of your effects could be content context specific because of this like such massive sort of change in higher education. Um, in that, in, in, a, in, a, in, in last, last point there, I think it would be good if you maybe uh, cite um, effects from other studies exploring network peer effects to just have a sense of the magnitude, you know, how big or small this is, this finding is. Um, and then my second, uh, and this is more out of my own curiosity. So the paper is talks about the positive effects of having friends that are aspiring to go to college. Uh, and I'm really curious if what happens if we look at the opposite relationship. So what if my friends are kind of not interested in college? Do we find like similar effects? Uh, in the, in the opposite kind of direction. Um, are these peer effects symmetrical? Uh, I would, that would be very interesting to see. But overall, it was, it was really interesting and super, I think, well-executed paper. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And um, at this point, we would sort of um, open up for questions from the audience, but I don't see any questions in the Q&A box. So what I'm going to do is to sort of, and I don't see any hands raised either. So I'm going to give the opportunity to the speakers to sort of give us very brief one minute responses to some of the issues, comments that have been made by the discussants. I'm very aware that we are practically out of time. So just one minute to each speaker um, on the comments received from um, the discussants. So I'm going to start off with David. Any responses that you have to some of the comments um, that you received? Yeah, just quickly, thanks a lot for the for the comments, Jessica. I think the idea of looking at this for other other countries and thinking about what, you know, we'd love to just sort of get this measure like everywhere. It would be really interesting in how it's changed. And uh, we haven't really thought so much about doing it like the US. That's a really good uh, idea. And um, yeah, we need to sort of update about the, the Brazilian school system. I mean, it did change. So it's always hard to know, like when you're thinking of the whole population, it's actually kind of a serious issue, but thanks for, thanks for raising it. Cause I think we need to think about sort of when, how, how, how to treat that, but thanks a lot. Thank you, David. Monica, quick reactions. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much, um, David, for um, the, the comment. Yes, we have actually talked a lot about, um, you know, the reverse of, you know, um, the, the IOP variables actually affecting consumption inequality, particularly for um, parental um, education. We, we are thinking of ways of dealing with that, um, you know, um, so that we, we can get, get around that issue. In, in some papers that we, ha we have looked at, similar papers that have done this, they have just identified or maybe acknowledged that this is a problem, but then the paper doesn't really say much about that, uh, how they deal with that. So we are still um, working around that. And I do um, appreciate the comment on the random noise. I think we'll have to look at that and if nothing at all, maybe indicates in the paper that this, there's a possibility of, you know, the noise in terms of the different things with the marking that might be going on. Yeah, so, um, and the point on looking at the relationship between fathers, the inequality in fathers' education and how that affects um, outcomes would, would, could also be explored. We can actually do this and then maybe um, just even put it in the appendix of the paper. I think that would be useful for um, the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. Daniela? Yeah, so thank you, Monica, for your comments. Um, I really appreciate the, your comment about context. That is very much in my mind, and I will definitely do so. Um, the other uh, uh, comment that you gave me that I just wanted to say, so this more strict version of autonomy, I think that's very important. And in fact, I conducted all my analysis for a more strict definition of that. So decisions just taken by women only. And the majority of my results hold in that, using that more like strict uh, version of autonomy. And I will definitely look at the heterogeneous treatment effects according to the spousal educational characteristics. I think that's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela. Finally, Jessica. So thank you so much, Daniela. Those uh, two very interesting uh, suggestions. Yes, I, I, I think it's very important actually to contextualize more on, on the higher education context of Brazil, because just as you said, there's like a very uh, interesting expansion at that time. So that's something that I, I should add. About the second comment on like whether uh, the, the, like the results would also hold if my friends don't wanna go to college. Uh, I, I started to explore some, modern, some other information that I have on, on, the, on the data, which is like um, some careers that students identify themselves with. And so I basically look on whether uh, they identify more with some careers that need college aspiration, sorry, college uh, degree and some careers that would not need a uh, college degree. And uh, I only find an impact of peer effects in those careers that would, uh, would need a college degree. So those who don't uh, like who, who wants kind of uh, yeah, careers like less demanding in terms of education, they actually also do not influence their friends on that. So this is something that I, I still have to work a little bit more, but I'll, I'll add in the paper because I also think it's interesting, but thank you so much. 
Thank you very much, Jessica. So we've listened to four very interesting papers, generally on the causes and determinants of education and learning in different countries across the world. In South, Af in South America, we learned that education has the potential to reduce women's autonomy. We also discovered that although returns to schooling can affect economic inequality, this depends largely on the level of schooling that the returns are measured at. Now, with respect to the determinants of learning outcomes in Ghana, inequality of opportunities appears to be an important factor to consider. And in Brazil, peer networks are significantly linked to higher educational aspirations. Now, at this point, I'd like to inform you that there will be a virtual meet the author session immediately after this, where you are welcome to interact with the authors, with the speakers, some more on some of these very interesting findings. So at this point, I would like to bring the session to a close. Thank you for your attendance. And I look forward to seeing you in the Meet the Author session immediately after this. Thank you very much. I'll just much. say I have a question for Jessica that I'll ask her in the Meet the Author session if we get to get there. Sounds great. Okay. So let's head over there right now. Thank okay. you very much. Bye. Thank you. All right, then. Bye.